very good. Thank you for that. And um, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see such a good turnout. I think it shows that there's a real interest in, in, uh, in these wonderful careers that our alumni have built for themselves. And without further ado, because I know we wanna get right to them, I'm gonna introduce um, uh, our own campus's archivist for special collection, Acelia Camacho, who's gonna be hosting this evening. And thank you so much, if evening, this Zoom. <laughs> and thank you so much, Acelia, for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for asking me. So um, I am going to introduce our four panelists. Um, so I'll start off with that. Um, our first panelist is Amalia Castañeda. She's the archivist at Girth Archives and Special Collections at CSU Dominguez Hills. Amalia graduated from Cal State LA with an MA in history and received her MA in library science from UCLA. Um, our other panelist is Teresa Chapa. She's a Latin American, Iberian, and Latina Latino Studies librarian at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Teresa received a BA in Spanish and an MA in Latin American Studies from Cal State LA. And she also has a PhD in Latin American Literature from the University of Kansas and an MA in Library and Information Science from North Carolina Central University. And then we also have Gladys Garcia, who is currently pursuing, hi Gladys, <laughs> who is currently pursuing a master's in information science at the University of Michigan. Uh, Gladys received a BA in Asian and Asian American Studies and Latin American Studies from Cal State LA. And she's also been awarded the Spectrum, Spectrum Scholarship from the American Library Association. Um, and then last but not least, we have Jimmy Zavala. He is the teaching and learning librarian at the Library Special Collections at UCLA. Um, Jimmy received a BA in Latin American Studies and an MA in History from Cal State LA and an MA in Library Science at UCLA. So, so we have great panelists for you today and I'm really excited to be part of this as well. Um, and thank you for letting me be part of this, um, Dr. Erika Verma and Enrique Ochoa. Um, and we have a couple of questions for our panelists um, just to get the discussion started and everybody will get to ask questions afterwards. Um, again, Dr. Erika Verba mentioned that this is kind of informal and casual. So, so um, hopefully we have a really great vibrant discussion about um, careers in archives and libraries. Um, so first off, I'd like to ask, could you all speak about your academic trajectory and how that led you to a career in libraries and archives? And whoever would like to start first from our panelists. Uh, or you want me to call on you? <laughs> all right, all right, I'm gonna call you. Okay, how about Jimmy, you start off. <laughs> sure. um, no, thank you for uh, Professor Chow for inviting me to be a part of this panel, it's definitely fine to see you and I'm glad it's in Amalia and nice to meet all of you who are here today. Uh, just happy to be here. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, my interests even on the profession really started, you know, I was doing the master's in history. Um, as, you know, when I was doing the MA program, you know, there I was working at the LAPL, it was not just called the library. And so I think that allowed me to kind of get a little bit more, you know, first-hand account and insight of, you know, what the profession consisted of and what to expect. And so um, I started researching just more into it, you know, and, you know, once I finished the, the MA program, you know, I continued working for you know for LAPL, and uh, my my real focus kind of was on archives, given that you know it's just kind of these historical documents, right? Primary resources that you work with. So my intent was really focusing on you know kind of doing research, and you know working with archives in a way that really um, I, I guess tried to focus on you know histories or, or narratives that you often don't see you know, and, and special collections, right? Um, and that was kind of my interest, you know, when I did the UCLA program, you know, say different community archives. And so really focusing on, you know, kind of talking about, you know, these challenges, right? That, you know, and especially I think in academia that oftentimes, you know, you don't see a lot of representation from, you know, black, indigenous, other people of color, you know, and other marginalized communities. And, so it kind of steered a little bit more in the sense that I, you know, did the archives track at UCLA, but really ended up being more, you know, of this librarian position, although still working with archives, but more like in a librarian position, more as a um, kind of teaching with primary sources, right? And so 
I, I think that's the thing I think about the profession is that, you know, you have like library studies, you have like archives track, you know, you know informatics, but they really, there's a lot of overlap, you know, between and like these different tracks or stations. And um, that, that was kind of it. So it was really kind of this desire of working with, you know, documents, historical documents, you know, and narratives, but also um, I, I guess contributing in a way to really challenging you know, what gets to be preserved and collected, right? And why that is and, and why that matters, especially for students, you know, who don't see themselves represented, you know, in these narratives and these stories and, and the significance and importance of that and, you know, attempting to, I guess, do something about it, you know, in, in a way. And yeah, I, I would say that's kind of like the, the trajectory really, um, my, my, my interest in going to work into the profession. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. Um, does anyone would, would like to answer that question, Teresa? Or... Sure. Yeah. So um, Erica's not gonna remember this, but I did talk with her mother about becoming a librarian before I started my PhD program in Latin American uh, literature. And uh, Erica, you probably don't remember, but we had a conversation about how libraries were kind of becoming not as important as they once were. This is way back, right? When librarians were, at libraries were in transition. And um, so I ended up doing a PhD program and I went on and became a professor actually. Um, I even went as far as getting a tenure, but all along I was not really excited about what I was doing. So, and I, I, you did mention that I had um, done a, a BA in Spanish and a master's in Latin American studies. So the PhD was in literature, but um, I felt very secure in that Latin American realm. So when I um, was a professor, I was already looking at library science as a possibility. And fortunately at that time, um, Mellon had a postdoctoral fellowship at Duke. And um, I decided that I was going to sneak out of my position as a professor and try this new field. And this was exactly the right program for me because it was for anybody with a PhD in a Latin American related position or um, discipline. And so it was a way to bring subject specialists into the field. And that's my trajectory into library science. Um, so it was like a back door. So I would also call this a second career. Um, Did you ever think about going into library science when you were at Cal State LA or was that was something that was more in your mindset when you were you know, pursuing your PhD? I think it was uh, just about the time that I was in the middle of my PhD program. And it wasn't even that I um, was that motivated into it. It was just that I didn't want to write a dissertation, I think. Okay. <laughs> it was just so frightening. I didn't want to worry about it. I was just looking for a, a way, another route. And um, I don't think I really pursued it seriously. It wasn't until um, I actually, when I was a faculty member, um, I was the liaison to the library and I learned more about the library side of things um, then. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. All right, um, Gladys. <laughs> Can you repeat the question again? Uh, how was it our career tra trajectory into yeah. uh, LAS? Yeah, so could you speak about your academic trajectory and how that led you to, you know, an interest in career in libraries and archives? Yeah, so the, my interest in archives didn't really happen until like my last year at Cal State LA. And by that point, I was doing my, a joint program in Latin American studies and Asian American studies. And I was already working as the library clerk for the Latin American studies program. 
And for the Asian American Studies program, I was a part of a um, oral history project in which like I worked closely with the special collections and archives on campus to like eventually have those um, interviews like incorporated into the archives. And um, while I was working as a library clerk, uh, it was my last semester there that I got an internship there at the archives on campus. And um, while I was there, I was doing my internship and I was making up a collection of materials from the LAS Center, uh, specifically on Central American solidarity movements in, in the Los Angeles area. And while I was doing my internship, I had the opportunity to visit Guatemala as a human rights observer with an organization called Nizgua. And there I was kind of like, oh my goodness, I could like pursue a career in archiving, archiving, uh, litigating, litigating for human rights abuses. And so since then, that was in 2017. Since then, I've still been like dead set on pursuing a, a career path with doing archival work with human rights abuses. And I'm in Michigan at the moment, finishing up my, um, my master's in information sciences. And you'll be graduating this spring? Yeah, this upcoming spring, or at least we call it winter 2020, 20 winter semester because the majority of the semester is winter. Uh, not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm still not used to being in Michigan, but it is what it is. Thanks, Gladys. Amalia? <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, so yeah, similar to other people, my uh, path into librarianship wasn't linear either. I really discovered the field, so to speak, in, um, as a grad student. And what I always find an, um, interesting about <laughs> my path into librarianship is that when I was an undergrad at UCLA, I worked in library special collections, but I didn't know that I did. I didn't know what it was. Like I thought I worked in the research library in the basement. So I, I it's a hilarious story because I, it, I honestly can say it didn't click that I worked in special collections until grad school when I decided I wanna be a librarian. And I look back and I'm like, oh my God, that was the special collections department. So I always use that story because I think it's like very telling about sometimes like the invisibility of students in spaces like that, like all students, I think, but especially like students of color, um, because I didn't, you know, find myself in the space. I quickly left for another job within a few months. Um, so I always feel like that story is a nice um, uh, I, I think it's very telling um, because when I was an undergrad, I, I, you know, I was, I didn't study history. I went on to, a, you know, a graduate degree in history, but I was studied political science and I was actually caught in some of the pipeline programs really early on at UCLA. So I was a freshman and I'm like, I'm going to become a professor. So I like worked my four undergrad, undergraduate years doing undergraduate research and, and, you know, all that. I was actually in the Mellon program, which is the first Mellon cohort. Um, and the West Coast at UCLA back in 2008. So again, I was like set on that path. I'm going to become a political science professor. Then I hit my, you know, senior year. And, you know, you're meeting all these like really talented students across the country that are just like confident and articulate. And I was just like, everybody's smarter than me. I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. So I graduated and, you know, I had like, I look back and my CV, maybe I could have gone into a program. I mean, I had the research experience, good grades, but I really felt like I can't do this. Like everybody's so much smarter than me. I can't do grad school. So I took three years off and I was working a lot of random jobs. I was like a medical biller at one point doing administration. I worked for UCLA parking. I even interned at an adult school because I thought maybe I could teach English to adults. So I did a, like a little bit of everything. And that's always like the gap year that I sometimes forget that happened. But it was like, in my mind, it was very frustrating, right? Because when you're in your early 20s, like you think your life is over. But um, at that point, I thought, oh, God, what am I going to do? And I think it finally hit me by my maybe second, third year that I was like, you know what? I should take a shot at grad school. Maybe I can survive it. <laughs> and so I decided to, you know, um, my, you know, uh, my, my, my good people around me convinced me that I was fine. So I went into, I went to master's program at Cal State LA in history, again, having taken that three year weird gap of um, random jobs. And that's when I uh, started volunteering in the archives there. There was a, 
uh, it was at the time they were doing a Ruben, a Ruben uh, Salazar exhibit. So I was there, um, I think to get my ID or something. So I went into the library and it was like, oh, that looks really cool. They're putting up this exhibit. Like, I kind of want to learn about that. And that was how I contacted Azalea and said, hey, this is who I am. I really don't have a background in this, but like, you know, I work really hard and I want to learn. So, <laughs> and I went into her office and this was like literally, I think six years ago and it was in the fall of 2014. And, and yeah, and we've been uh, inseparable ever since, you know, we're colleagues now and, and friends and, um, you know, learned a lot from, learned a lot from archives from Azalea and then went on to sort of take on a, num a range of uh, different opportunities. So it was really when I was in the history program that I, I went into the history program thinking I wanted to do a PhD in history. That was my track. And then I discovered the library. So I kind of switched gears um, halfway through that. And Professor Ochoa witnessed that as well. And um, when I was working with him on my on my uh, research and thesis, and yeah, and then I went on to the program at UCLA, and uh, soon after I started a position uh, at Cal State Dominguez Hills, which is where I am now. Thanks, Amalia. I have a similar experience too that I'd like to add to what you were saying about your experience at UCLA and not knowing that you're you're actually working in a special collections. I actually, after I uh, graduated from, I was a communications major in journalism. After I graduated from Cal Poly Pomona, I'm also part of the CSU system, um, but I graduated from Cal Poly Pomona, got a job at UCLA working at the Southern Regional Library Facility scanning and digitizing materials for JSTOR. I had no clue what I was doing. It was a temporary position <laughs> right here. Um, so I have that same experience Amalia is talking about. They actually even offered me to pay for school for my MLIS at UCLA. And I actually was like, I'm not gonna be a librarian. This doesn't seem very interesting or engaging to me. I know, I know. And I ended up, after, it's true, but when you think about that and what Amalia is saying is like, there's missed opportunities to engage, you know, students of color in these types of things, like, you know, with the collections that we relate to or from our communities. So I've noticed that a lot within, um, the profession where we have these missed opportunities or there's no exposure to you know what it really means to work in a library what it is to be an archivist or or the types of opportunities you have so i have that similar experience amali and i talk about that a lot and with other professionals in the field um but yeah i just wanted to add that part because i think that's something important but yeah to add um, and then I do have another question, and it's how did you transition from Cal State LA to, and you all kind of touched on it, but how did you transition from Cal State LA to pursuing your MLIS? But, Teresa, if you'd like to start. <laughs> yeah. So my transition, I guess, is not really a transition to uh, library science because I had so many other steps along the way. So um, I guess it's, um, I do have to mention, I did work at Cal State in the library. I did have the most fantastic librarian who used to serve the Latin American studies students, Mary Gormley. I'm sure none of you have ever heard her name. Uh, she's somebody from um, our past. I don't know if Erica, probably never met her though. Uh, but anyway, people that um, I'm still friends with from my master's program at Cal State still remember her. She was um, an incredible resource for us when we were working on our master's there. And to this day, we still remember her fondly. In fact, I had a phone call with um, a, um, a colleague and friend from that period in my life. And we were uh, reminiscing about her. So I think that um, that link to the way that Mary served us back then is something that I took with me when I was finally at that point where I wanted to be a subject specialist librarian, um, a Latin American studies librarian. And I, I do remember how well she served us and how important she was in our um, success. So that would be the link with Cal State and library science. I've actually seen um, her name come up in the archives, like the okay. library's archives. So I've seen her name come up and I think she's also developed like a 
a, a collection of some materials that we have in the archives. Um, so I've seen her name, <laughs> never met I her. Believe, I, I was, looked her up, I did a Google search earlier, um, but I spelled her name wrong, so I probably didn't get a lot of good hits. Anyway, um, she gave the university um, a Native American art yes. collection as well. So yes. that's what I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's the collection that I, I remember seeing her, uh, seeing her name being part of that one. So yeah. I do have to just say one other thing is um, I went on and did other graduate work and at the other universities um, that I went to, I never had an active librarian like Mary in my life. Mary would come to our classes and really work with us one-on-one. -on -one. Um, even though I went on and, and did other work, I never had that experience again. Even when I was doing my PhD program, I never went to the subject specialist librarian at, at uh, the University of Kansas. So I have to say that it can be one person that can really make a difference, especially if they're doing that outreach that um, as I'm assuming all of you, um, you all do, right? Because we all know how important it is to reach the students, so. Um, Jimmy, would you like to? Perfect. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, that transition, I, I think, to my last prime was, I think it was challenging in the sense because, you know, I mean, the profession is like, you know, 80 something percent white, right? So, you know, at UCLA, even though it's, you know, it's still Los Angeles, right? Going from a Cal State to like a UC, it's definitely different. And, you know, you know, it's like, you know, you said it's like in the West side, right? Cal State is much over here to the East side. So it was definitely like a culture shock, even though, you know, my hometown here is LA, you know, I'm from LA. So it was challenging, I think, from that perspective of really, you know, when you're, when you're part of the culture there, you know, you know, not seeing a lot of other, you know, like black, you know, black students, right, or, or other, you know, people of color students, you know, indigenous students. So it's definitely, you know, I, I think a challenge of that, and I think it definitely reflects, you know, kind of like the overall profession in terms of, again, like being like a something percent white, I, I think, but can be difficult in that sense, um, you know, for sure. And again, it's, um, you know, just I think the way UCs operate, you know, are definitely different than, you know, Cal State's for sure. And so it, it was a little bit difficult to find, you know, some type of community, I think, with um, other peers, you know, during the program. But I think what um, the, the program itself, you know, wasn't necessarily that uh, challenging in the sense of, I, I think, having the experience of having done a master's already a transition to like another master's program, you kind of know what to expect, at least in terms of like the workload, you know, and, and whatnot. So um, it's definitely something that, you, you know, you know, you're thinking of like, you know, pursuing a career in that, it, it can definitely be challenging from that aspect, right? You're trying to find community and also understanding that, um, you know, there's not like a lot of, you know, people of color, you know, in, in the profession per se, right? And, and, I, and I think, you know, speaks against this idea of really, um, you know, either students not being aware of this as a potential professional career or, you know, librarians or archivists, you know, as the profession not doing enough to really uh, make aware of students that this is a potential career profession, right? And, and supporting them in, in, in many ways. Like I know there's like a lot of um, scholarships, you know, and opportunities for sure, but there's not like a lot of, I, I think support after like you receive a scholarship, nobody follows up with you or, you know, there, there's a lot of things I think that can definitely change for, for the better in the profession for sure. So, you know, it, it's good and bad, I, I think, you know, definitely, but um, it's definitely not without its challenges. Yeah, I can, thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, I'll Amal. Go next. Yeah, I just wanted to go next because, you know, Jamie and I also went from Cal State LA to UCLA. But what's interesting about my experience, I guess, is it was like a second homecoming to UCLA. So I think my both diff, both transitions to each transition to UCLA was different, right? So the first time I went to UCLA was as an undergrad, right? So I, I grew up in Linwood in the Southeast side, right? It was in, entirely black and brown, including even some of my teachers. So it was, uh, you know, 
you know, certainly a lot of disadvantages, but now that I like reflect back on it, it was like, I was able to be myself there because we were all at the same socioeconomic level. So it's like, you were just who you were based on like who you were, right? So then you get to, um, we were, I, would, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I was able to flourish and in coming into myself. So and again, I jumped from Linwood High to UCLA. And of course that was a culture shock, but at the same time, because the undergrad experience is like, it's really easy to find like your pockets and your niche. And there's so much like the undergrad experience, I would say is like, they do a fantastic job in making it kind of a thrilling experience. And um, so I was fine. I was always a person of color and I was, you know, definitely a minority, but I feel like I had my people or I had a group that I felt at home with. So I, it was okay. It was, it was an, I had an amazing time. I felt like um, I, you know, I, I loved UCLA. I always called it like my second home. So then I came to Cal State LA as a grad student and I was like, oh, this is such a different experience. Like it was, um, it was, really amazing to be able to just really be myself and not, you know, there's just so many students of color at Cal State LA where suddenly like, I think I, re I realized then it's like, oh, I don't think twice when I speak up in class because I'm not representative of my group. If I say something off, it's me, like not saying something that's not that smart. It's not like I'm not representing my group or, you know, my background. So that I, I came to terms with when I was at Cal State LA and I really, really like loved my experience there from the professors I met to the students that I met. And, you know, I worked in the archives. So that became kind of like a little niche for me. You know, I was coming into myself and I've talked to Dr. Ochoa about it. And I said, oh, you know, like, you know, I'm finally like more confident and blah, 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 blah. And then I started going to like librarian conferences. And this is why I was a history grad student. And I, I talked, talked to him one day and I said, oh my God, I thought like, the imposter syndrome or the culture shock was over and I'm like experiencing this all over again. And like, I feel like I'm a more fully formed adult and I'm more confident, but it's still happening. And then I go to UCLA again for grad school and it was like culture shock times 10 for me. I was felt again, even more intimidated or more defeated at times than when I was a freshman, right? Maybe because I was more wide-eyed and optimistic when I was a freshman or I didn't notice what was around me, but um, yeah, I think there were, I think in my, in co my cohort, there was, I think there were fewer than 10% students of color and that included all of us, right? We had no, no black students, uh, maybe two Asian American students, um, two, maybe two Latinas. I don't think we had any um, indigenous students. So it was like a very non-diverse cohort. So um, it was, it was very depressing my first semester. Again, I was questioning like, why am I here? I, I thought about it, um, wasn't sure if they had made the right like choice. Like I knew I wanted to do this work because I had worked in the archives before I'd done the, I had done the, the actual work, right? But um, it was like a pretty like awful experience the first year. Um, but then my second year, I realized that I needed to do what I did my when I was an undergrad that I hadn't really put together. And it's like find my group. And I joined like Reforma, um, which is, you know, which is a, a, a group of, you know, professional group of librarians um, for that do, you know, work for, for Latinos, for the Spanish speaking. And this is outside of my program. And then I obviously started just making friendships within the program. I started talking to people about it, um, how I felt. And the second year was a lot more, you know, it was a lot better. Um, I, I survived it, but um, yeah, I guess I do want to just not make a secret of it. Like the library experience, like a library program experience was like really isolating and, and not, not the most exciting. I mean, I had great professors. I really did. My advisor was fantastic. But outside of that, I just couldn't like find my ground. And I'm like not a shy person and I am not quiet. So I was like, what is going on? I felt like I, I, I felt like a kid again where I just couldn't find my grounding or I was like in, sometimes intimidated to speak up or I couldn't, I couldn't, um, couldn't find myself. So, yeah. Thank you, Amalia. Gladys, would you like to share? Yeah, sure. So um, I want to say like, my, my path to education wasn't linear in any way or in pursuing higher education. I mean, I 
you know, graduated early from high school at 16, then and I started community college. And then after community college is when I finally landed myself in Cal State LA. And I'm originally from Riverside, which is at the time very rural and now it's, it's changing. Um, but like once I landed myself in Cal State LA, and then like getting immersed in like the activism there and pursuing uh, my Latin American studies degree, you know, you know, the, the wheels were turning in my head that I was interested in doing something else outside of like, you know, being a professor or let, her, let alone getting deeper into nonprofit work. Um, and so when I made the connection, like, especially working at the special collections and archives on campus, that's when I kind of like realized like, oh my goodness, I could pursue a career in archives. And then especially like um, doing, taking the trip to Guatemala and visiting the Archivo Historico de Policia Nacional uh, that I realized I could do it in specifically in the support of like litigating for, um, human, for cases of human rights abuse. And so in between Cal State LA and then like how I've gotten to my master's now, um, that summer right after I took on two internships working for the, Chi the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California and Eugene is like super, super dope. And if they're still doing an internship, I highly encourage anybody to take that on and apply. Um, and then I pursued the um, a Getty internship in which I worked for the Center for the Study of Political Graphics. And with either of those inter internships, I wouldn't have done it had not Dr. Foon, um, you know, encouraged me to do so, and as well as Asalia encouraged me to pursue the Getty one. Um, so I did those two internships. I took two years off between like getting, getting my BA and my MA, and I worked for a community health center in Los Angeles, specifically in South Central in um, development, but in between um, my BA and my, M and my MSI, yeah, my MSI degree, I still volunteered my time, uh, still volunteered my time cataloging like the books and, and periodicals at the Latin American Study Center. And even though I wasn't able to go as often as I would have liked, I did it like at least like once a month or every two weeks. And I, that was like a labor of love because I was like working on that collection for like almost three, four years, like from the time I actually started work was actually an employee there and then still working on it as a volunteer. Um, that was like, I wanna say 2015. And I finished that up in 2019, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, but still nonetheless, like I got connected to the, Los Angeles Archivist Collective, and then the LA area library and information sciences, like folks in of color in the LA area. And I went to a couple of meetings with them before um, pursuing a master's in information sciences. And I wanted to do school out of state because in honesty, I knew I had a better chance getting uh, a fully funded for a scholarship in terms of um, getting my degree out of state than I would have than I would have if I stayed in California. And so I ended up here at the University of Michigan. And when I got accepted, or when I yeah, when I got accepted, I got accepted into all those schools I applied to. Um, but with UM, I had no idea that this was considered like a top 10 research institution or a public Ivy or whatever. I had no idea because being in the Midwest was not a priority, but things happen the way that they happen. Um, and so I'm here and as Amalia and Jimmy have said, like, you know, pursuing a master's in an, an LIS um, master's degree in a predominantly white field has been very challenging. Um, you know, and especially like since I'm far away from home, I'm the only person, I don't have any family nearby here in this state. So, you know, I've learned how to like find community in unlikely places. And, you know, uh, having friends definitely helps you get through the program and then just kind of under accepting like the program for what it is will also kind of help you come to terms with like what you want to do career wise, career wise. And so with me, since I want to do archival work, especially like in an international context, like I want to work outside of the United States. Um, 
there wasn't an easy laid out path for me laid out path for me to do so. So I've been very diligent in advocating for myself and networking with people and being unapologetic about it. And that, if anything, that's something that I would highly encourage anybody to do. Like, you know, make those connections, send those cold emails, even if you don't think that they'll respond. Um, something's better than nothing. And the more that you go through this program or, you know, get more disciplined with school, and um, becoming a professional, like the better of an advocate that you'll be for yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Gladys. Okay, so I do have a question of, can you all tell us a little bit about the current projects that you are working on now um, and your current positions? But I saw if you'd like to start. <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. What are the projects? So one of the things that I um, am working on is um, trying to get content together to put together a guide on disability studies in Latin America. Um, it's a, a growing field and important um, for our graduate students here at UNC Chapel Hill. So uh, that's one thing that's on the back burner at the moment. Um, I'm the chair of a regional group, Latin American Southeast Regional Librarians, which includes um, the larger universities here in the Southeast that have Latin American studies uh, subject specialists. We're working on an independence um, uh, project where we're trying to get together um, primary source material to put it in some kind of a guide for students for this because of the, um, you know, the independence movement um, year uh, 1821 that's coming up. And um, let's see what other, I'm trying to think of what other things I'm working on. Got a couple of other projects. Um, one of the things that's not happening right now because of um, COVID is that I'm not buying very many books. So, a lot of what I do is like look at um, content that I could buy. I have approval plans for a lot of my content, but I also do a lot of firm ordering. And so what I'm doing, I'm also the Native American and Amer um, Indigenous Studies librarian. So I am trying to get together the list of the content that I want to buy as soon as we're allowed to spend money. And so that's across all my disciplines. I'm trying to just keep the list going so that the day that those funds are released, I can um, acquire material, um, acquire the content, the material that we need. The only content that we're allowed to buy, uh, buy right now uh, is um, e-format material. So my position is primarily collection development. So that's kind of why I have those lists going. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We're also buying a lot of electronic resources at Cal State LA, so it's not any physical books, so yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I should also mention that one of the things that I um, love about my position is that I also buy artist books for the art library and for our uh, special collections library. So I'm also working in that area right now. I'm trying to find content that we can acquire as soon as funds are released. So that's always an ongoing project looking at artist books. Okay, great. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Jimmy, would you like to talk about some current projects that you're working on? Yeah, so um, you know, in my position, this is a uh, I started this position in you know, yeah, late June, so it's you know UCLA, and uh, so it's fairly recent, right? So um, the idea behind the position is really you know I'm in charge of uh, coordinating the primary source instruction program at UCLA and Special Collections. Uh, so um, you know working with colleagues outside of you know Special Collections, just general librarians who do instruction, collaborating with them, and also um, really, I, I guess, expanding the 
you know, the, the program at UCLA, the primary source instruction, since they never had a dedicated individual to specifically focus on, you know, primary source instruction. And so this was a new, you know, like a, a new position that they created. And, you know, just building a robust instruction program and really outreaching more to staff, not staff, but faculty on campus um, that, you know, like the library hasn't worked with in the past, you know, to offer these services to students and faculty and, you know, making students aware of, you know, these resources available to them, right? Because I think, you know, as Asalia or Amalia mentioned rather that, um, you know, and Gladys as well, that I think as undergraduate students, you know, you know, they're not often exposed to, you know, what archives or libraries are, right? And I think, you know, you'll find that a lot of students, I think primarily first generation students uh, and students of color, that they get into the profession because they work somehow in the capacity, right? In archives and library, but not necessarily thinking of it as a profession, like moving forward, right? And so I think the idea is to definitely you know, work with students, you know, expose undergraduate students primarily to, you know, these resources available to them at the same time, because, you know, a lot of them don't use them as well, right? And, you know, these are all part of your fees, right? That's part of your tuition. So, you know, taking advantage of these resources for, for your own research. And so um, I, I think it's really just that. And I think my focus is really, uh, again, working primarily with, with students and making sure they understand, you know, the importance of archives and the significance of archives, right? I think somebody in the chat mentioned that you know, archives are political, you know, and they are, right? You know, I think the library and archives profession likes to think of themselves as being neutral, and that's obviously not the case. And, and so um, it's really, you know, prior to joining UCLA, you know, I was the coordinator librarian for this project at UC Irvine, uh, where we analyzed the intersection of ethnic studies and community archives. So we worked with uh, specifically on the graduate students in the ethnic studies departments at UC Irvine, we just gave these lectures and these workshops on primary sources to these students um, about what archives are, you know, and, and community archives and the significance and the importance of, you know, you know, these students' histories and their narratives. And the idea was kind of to expose them to the profession, because again, a lot of them are not exposed to these, you know, potential career opportunities as undergraduate students. And also the significance of archives and the importance of like seeing yourself in history, right? That you know, I, I think of the times when we don't see ourselves represented in these archives, we think that our histories don't matter, or we think that, you know, we don't, they're not important, and it's not the case. Um, even if you don't see it, you know, you know, we all have, you know, personal photographs or personal papers, you know, those are all archives. Um, we just, you know, don't think of it as, as, as that oftentimes, but yeah, it's just developing this program, you know, this instruction program, and really, I think working more with, you know, the ethnic studies departments at UCLA, you know, and really, you know, work with undergraduate students. So it's, um, it's a little bit tricky, you know, doing this like in a remote environment, you know, but, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we're getting there. And beyond that, I, I think hopefully just, you know, researching, you know, have hopefully a couple of articles coming, one article coming out maybe next year. We'll see, but yeah. Great. That sounds like great. That's something that I think is really important, the work that you're doing and in engaging, you know, undergraduate students and engaging them with collections that reflect their own communities. That's something that's really important for us at Cal State LA too, um, especially to get not only students to think about this as a profession, but also give them those skills like the critical thinking skills, primary source literacy skills that they often don't get, right, until they they find out that type of stuff when they're in graduate school. You know, if they go to graduate school where they learn how to work with archives and things like that, but getting them early is probably like at an undergraduate level is probably, you know, ideal. I mean, Amalia and I have talked about even high school um, and so on so that students, when they come to like, universities, they, they get the experience, they know what that room is that looks like a museum, you know, um, what that's about and what types of materials they have there. So, so yeah. Thank you for doing that work. Yeah. And then Amalia, do you want to share some current projects, things that you have going on that you'd like yeah. to share? Yeah. So um, currently I'm working on uh, university archives uh, for Cal State Dominguez Hills um, as a 
person and studied history. I'm loving it. Like, I think it's really fantastic to really, because the collection I'm working on now is university relations. So it's like all the press releases and all like historical clippings of the university. So it's like, I've learned a lot of really fascinating things about the university in the area, which is, you know, that the campus was originally going to be in the affluent Palos Verdes, but they decided to move it to the current Carson Dominguez Hills location because of the uprisings in Watts in 65. So it was a way to provide opportunities for the black community at the time. So I think there are there's some really, really interesting history kind of leading up to that, like reports, recruiting reports and um, sort of some interesting facts about, you know, the, the, the founding of this, you know, CSU campus with social justice principles, right? Um, so aside from that collection, I'm also working on, because uh, the university archives, there wasn't a, a designated person to kind of do that work. So a lot of the finding aids are as old as the 90s. So like a lot of the stuff, you know, just because there's just so much huge amount of material has them in process and kind of put out to the public to, you know, to be accessed. So other than, of course, working on a finding aid for that collection that I discussed, I'm also working on doing outreach to different departments across campus, namely, you know, president's office, other administrative units to collect university archives. But what I'm especially excited about is doing outreach to like the student organizations. So I'm kind of working on like many presentations to kind of like come into like, you know, the student Greek organizations, the student organizations, uh, you know, some of the ethnic cultural organizations and to kind of talk to them, find a way to kind of articulate what we do, make it exciting and show them why it's really important that we acquire their, you know, their, their archives. So that's kind of the uh, project going into the next year. It'll be interesting to do it over Zoom because I'm a big person about, you know, I'm big on relationships and I'm big over like, hey, I ran into you. Let me go get you some coffee. because Let's talk about this and that, the, you know, forging relationships that way. But it'll be interesting to try to do it via Zoom in terms of, um, you know, getting getting the records into the archives, because as you all know, it's all about relationships. So getting people to trust us and to, you know, to to care for the materials, process their materials and make them accessible. It's always um, a, ch a challenge. So that's kind of the bulk of my work right now. Thanks, Amalia. Uh, Gladys, do you want to talk about some projects maybe you're working on or any? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, since I'm in school, I don't have any professional projects I'm a part of, but because of the fact that the master's I'm in, in is more dedicated to like information sciences, I'm exposed to a lot more like technical skills, such as like website development, you know, computer programming, um, how to work with like HTML, like different kinds of like com coding and com like computer science aspects. And so because of the program, like I'm exposed to like more projects than I thought I would have like pursued. So at the moment, um, I'm doing a client based project in which like I'm helping like, you know, make better transform like the current like online enrichment program for a, a facility. What's it called resident services facility for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so, yeah, that's that's something that we're I'm pursuing at the moment. Other projects that I've done is like do consultation on how to like better um, like the outreach outreach and like patron engagement for like a museum here in the local area in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, I've also uh, taken part of a project on like creating like a collection development policy for the Jim Crow Museum here in Michigan, located in Big Rapids. And so that's a museum dedicated to like all kinds of racist me memorabilia from like the 1960s up until now. Um, so yeah, those are the kinds of projects that I, I've been a part of. I mean, aside from that, I've like been, I've been dabbling in something called like documenting the now which is a project, yeah, um, dedicated to like helping local local activist organizations here in the United States um, document um, acts of police violence, particularly particularly in black and brown communities. And so it's kind of like been like a group of like archivists and other people who have like technical skills in that way to help support activists to, to do this work. 
Um, so that's been something I've a part, been a part of. I mean, aside from that, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, doing a lot of the networking. And I recently applied to the a job with the United Nations, which would potentially um, place me in Santiago de Chile. So with the global and communications department. And so, yeah, those are more or less like the projects I've been a part of. I mean, yeah, school keeps me very busy. I haven't been able to like devote time to other things, but um, yeah, those are things that I've been a part of. Those sound like great projects um, and you'll be graduating soon. So yeah. Um, so I do have one final question and then we can open it up to um, participants to, or um, people who are part of the, the session today to ask questions because I noticed there's some questions in the chat and we can get to those later. Um, but this is the last question I have. I know you all kind of touched on the challenges of going to MLIS programs and you know the profession and you know what kind of knowing those challenges what kind of advice would you give to you know students now that are really interested in pursuing an MLIS or you know how can they get started also too in the program uh, or you know, I know that sometimes it's really difficult to get into this field because even if you have the education, you don't have the experience. So what type of advice would you give to a student that's that's interested in pursuing this? Um, Teresa, if you'd like to start, yeah. I'm always starting first and then I think of what I really wanted to say when I've heard other people talk. You and can I always add mention, later. You can always add later. This is a discussion. So yeah, you so can always I add. I want to mention one thing that unfortunately ended with um, working from home, but, and I'm very interested to know if people have had um, good experience with this. We've been trying to do outreach with the um, K through 12 community here so that we can share our collections with the K through 12 community. So one of the things that we've, decided to do was to take artist books and zines to the high school art classes and talk about them and encourage them to um, not only come to visit our own collections, but to also make them. So we were going to do this whole project where we were making zines with high school students. And so when I heard all of you talking about outreach and community um, projects, I would love to know how one successfully does that. So that's for another moment, but I, I'm throwing it out there because it's so hard to do. And of course it was all um, interrupted, but um, I'm really curious. So if anybody does have any suggestions about that, I'd be happy to have a conversation afterwards. Um, in so we have a library school and I see that many times um, I meet with students who are uncomfortable just, you know, we've already talked about this a bit. I haven't, but others have about how there aren't many people of color in library school programs and um, they feel disenfranchised. Fortunately, um, many have come to me, even though they're not doing um, a degree, their MLS has nothing to do with uh, being a subject specialist librarian, but they, um, I feel that uh, it's important to have some kind of interaction so that that um, discomfort they feel is at least um, uh, dealt with so that they feel comfortable in the experience. So I would say that I would look really carefully at the library science program that you um, decide to select to make sure that it's not going to be um, more than you want to handle. It's hard to move to the South. It's hard to move to North Carolina and live here. Um, I don't know how you feel in Michigan, but I love Ann Arbor, by the way. So I think I would feel comfortable there. And I don't the like the cold. That's okay, part of it. Okay. And then like, there's no such thing as like good Mexican food here. It's just spoiled California people. We have the best right. produce. <laughs> right, right. But you know, it's, I think I don't, and you'd know more than I, because you're in a program right now, you've got to know that your program is going to be fulfilling in some way. And if you do feel uncomfortable, that there are other, um, there are things that make up for it, like excellent faculty programs um, that you can participate in, like you're engaged with the community, which is excellent. 
Um, so I would be very careful about the program you choose. Other than that, I think that um, finding mentors, um, and they don't have to be where you are, but somebody or a group of people that can help you through the difficult parts. So I didn't go through a traditional library science program because I did that postdoc. Um, so I don't have that experience, but I've seen others go through it and have so many challenges. And it's very frustrating to see um, people feeling defeated and dejected because they don't have um, the colleagues that they expected to have. They don't have the environment that they wanted um, in their graduate program. So that's all I can offer right now. Thank you. Would anyone else like to, to add to that? Yeah, I, I can connect with what Teresa just said. Uh, thank you for explaining that uh, very well in terms of like researching like where you're potentially interested in doing like your master's or your MLIS or MSI degree. Um, yeah, I mean, since, since I chose schools that were all out of state, you know, if you're considering do, to doing going that route, you know, aside from like what the program could potentially offer you like skill wise or resource resource wise, you, you know, you should really consider like the location. Like, is this something that you could imagine yourself being happy at, being happy, being happy there? Because if it's like far away from like, from your home or your community, um, is there an existing community that you could get tapped into? And if not, um, you know, try to get to know like your co cohort and kind of plan like maybe, you know, these are people that you could potentially be friends with. So yeah, cons consider the locations, considering the locations a big thing. I would also say, um, you know, really like cement those, cement those, those relationships with your mentors that you have already going and like see if they have like any, any like opportunities that they know of or could connect you with people. Um, research professors or people who are doing kind of like research interested in what you're like kind of interested in at each school that you're looking at because it'll help inform like your 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 research statements and your statements of purpose when you apply but like also those are the people um you would want to eventually get connected with once you once you get there um i guess yeah uh, and another thing would be, um, you know, re research, research all the scholarships possible, you know, definitely from the Society of American Archivists, the American Library Association, and then there's a couple more based on like the region in the United States. Um, and so yeah, yeah. Um, and if the school, if you want to try to get it to uh, a scholarship for school that pays for your entire sc schooling, um, you know, research research that as much as possible and yeah yeah and decide whether or not you like to be somewhere where whether or not you could be somewhere cold <laughs> okay thanks Gladys um Jimmy would you like to share uh yeah I, I think you know besides what you know Teresa and Gladys already mentioned also um you know, there's also online program. So if, you know, you're honest, you know, there's some in library schools so you know, you don't have to be there uh, physically in person, they offer online. I think San Jose State is one of the programs offer online. I think Simmons in Boston. So there's, there's also opportunities, I think, you know, if, you know, if it's more, if it offers more flexibility, I guess, you know, to students, because sometimes, you know, you're working or whatnot, you don't have to move there physically. That's also like another option um and you know I, yeah I, I think networking is important you know that's that kind of glass already mentioned it um if you're able to like join professional you know memberships like you know reforma amalia mentioned reforma or you know the american library association just to get a sense of you know what to expect you know there's also like local groups like you know uh gladys mentioned los angeles archivist collective um there's like a librarians of color los angeles group also, uh, so different types of, you know, I guess organizations also outside of professional memberships that, 
you know, you can, you know, talk to individuals, network, you know, what their experiences are in the field. Um, and also, you know, if you have the opportunity, you know, you know, I, I think getting involved, right, in like volunteering, you know, like to see, to get like, I, I think, firsthand experience of what that feels like, right? Whether, I know it's a little bit different right after the times and everything, it's like post, but, you know, like it's like a public library, like, a, you know, some type of archives and stuff. Like that. I think that helps a lot to get really first on account of, you know, what to expect and, and also seeing whether you would think of yourself, you know, being part of the profession or moving forward. So I, I think networking is key and also, you know, definitely getting like some type of first hand account of what to expect in the field. Okay, great, thank you. And Amalia. Yeah, so I guess what I will say too is, I mean, of course, experience, 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 like getting as much of it as possible in any way as while you're a student, because that's not only when you're eligible for more things, you could potentially get like class credit for hours and things, because the truth is that this profession um, is very middle and upper class for a reason, because oftentimes opportunities are not paid. And that's a whole other issue and potentially whole other panel. But I think it's really taking advantage as much as you can while you're an undergrad or while you're a grad student to get that experience because, yeah, there's similar and maybe it seems exciting. But once you're in there, like we've had volunteers when we we're at Cal State, some people are like, this is boring. This is not for me. And then there are other people that are like fascinated by it. And you know, if it's you, it's either you love it or you hate it, right? It's either for you or it's not. And, There's 21 um, that didn't like it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or others that may have not said it, but never, nevertheless, they got a good experience. It's not for everyone, right? Um, for me personally, as soon as I started working in the archive, I was like, oh, this is for me. Like it, it, it suddenly like clicked, right? Um, that I was probably, this probably was the right path for me. Um, and, and, and aside from experiences too, I say even coupling it with uh like going out into conferences because when I was at Cal State LA like it was most of us were obviously students of color just by the demographics of our campus but I went into like my first uh, library conference while I was still a history grad student and as much as yeah I was probably like the only one of my background in that but nevertheless like when I was there I came back and that's when I was in the cusp of deciding whether I wanted to pursue a PhD in history or maybe go into librarianship I came back from the conference and I said, oh, I found my people. Like, this is it. There's something about it. Like, this is the right mix for me. Um, you know, because in librarianship, obviously, depending on your position, there's sort of a mix of the practical and like the intellectual and the research and like, like the nerdiness that like, it, this was for me, like I identified with it. Um, so yeah, I think only being in there. And again, every library is different, but you will get a taste, obviously. So either get experience that different types of libraries um, or different types of, you know, different systems and then going into the professional field and talking to the people because these will be your colleagues. I think, I think like you'll know, you know, and I think that's why, you know, I think despite the many challenges that this field has, of course, and especially for people of color, like I think, um, oh, what was I going to say? I'm blanking out. Um, uh, yes, I was going to say, um, there are um, there are definitely some some really great opportunities for um, either where it's you know whether it be um, really specific interests or really broad interests right and especially if you have you know the flexibility to move across the country for jobs then you know you kind of um, open that up for um, for yourself so yeah okay great thanks Amalia I want to add one more thing because I did go to San Jose State and I did the online program if you do choose to do an online program try to get experience working I was working in a library already as a library assistant and that really helped with me understanding because online it's really difficult to connect and talk to people but it really helped me talk to my colleagues or my coworkers about some of the projects and I also got to use real life projects that I was doing in the library for so it kind of you know did double duty because I used them for um, my projects for my classes or my courses so I think that's really good to point out because sometimes you feel like in library school you might just be doing these projects and it's not going to have like a real impact it's just a project for the course but if you are working in a library make sure you take or in some volunteer capacity or anything take advantage of that and use it for you know your courses or if you can um, so I would I would recommend that um, okay, now we have about 20 more minutes, so I'll open up 
for uh, questions from from the from anyone who's joining us. And I think there's a question. There might be some questions in the chat. So let me see. I think Lita asked about if Cal State LA will develop an MA in library science and archives and social justice. I know that uh, Mario Ramirez, the head of special collections and Leti Perones, the librarian at Cal State LA are, are putting classes together for archival practice and also including social justice. So I know those are coming up um, about an MA program. I don't know, but um, at least there'll be some courses where students can get exposed to archives and social justice and social justice collections and things like that. So, so that should be coming up soon. Um, and if anyone else has, I think that's the only question I see in the chat, but if anyone else has a question, you can either, either raise your hand um, in the participants um, and go ahead and ask your question. You can add it in the chat. Okay, Nancy, go ahead and let's go with Nancy first. Hi, everyone. Um, I. I'm after listening to all your pen your speech. I'm like I'm more inspired now, but I'm still struggling a bit between, cause right now I'm a junior and I'm planning for grad school already ahead of time. But I don't know if I'm doing information science or library science or Cairo. So I was like, so what would like? I, cause I'm history major myself and with a minor too, so. And I really like information science, but I want to know a little bit more about it before I maybe pursue into it. So I know Gladys. I just want to ask Gladys, since you mentioned, <laughs> I'm like, because you're information science now. Yeah. So um, here at UM, University of Michigan, the information sciences actually was originally a library information sciences um, program, and then it started going more digital. And so with the, the reason why I pursued UM was because of the fact that they gave me a, a tuition scholarship. So that alleviates a lot of financial stress. So that's like a big factor if you end up applying for um, uh, an MA in, in library information sciences. Um, I guess like the, the difference between an LIS and an, and an, and an, and an MSI degree is that with an MSI degree, you're going to be learning a lot more technical skills, given the fact that the field in general is going very digital, like just lots of services and things online. And so when you learn these technical skills, it'll better, better enable you to kind of do it yourself as opposed to, you know, outsourcing that labor or like having somebody else like contract to do it. Like I'm learning Python and stuff like that. And oh my goodness, it makes my brain explode. But to a degree, I... I it's, it is useful, um, as well as like the website development. Um, so, and then I would also say to help you, Nancy, was kind of like, what is exactly is it that you want to do? Like in terms of a research or a project, if it, if it kind of needs technical skills, then maybe an MSI degree would be helpful. But then again, a lot of um, MLS, ML, MLIS degrees in general are, are, you know, adding those components in there. I know UCLA is. I was going to add that I think that there's going to be a shift in what library science is. Mm -hmm. Um, because of the way that we've been working the past few, several months. Um, and for example, I think that my position and the kinds of area studies positions that exist are going to be rethought out and refocused. And I think that um, the technical aspect is going to be more important in the future. So I think that um, what Gladys has said, it, it's important to know what you want for yourself, but it's also um, good to think about the future of library science. And it seems to be more um, technological than ever. Yeah, that's what I was saying too. Like that's what I was going into since now that I'm like, I'm barely my junior year and I still have two years, at least or a year and a half. So mm -hmm. by the time I'm studying and when I finish with everything future, you don't know what it will be like. So that's why I was going into um, what Gladys mentioned too. So I'm still planning, but I do have what I want, but I'm always 
curious on what I want. So I'm like always all over the place. So my oh, my mentors always tell me the same. They're like, you need to settle on one thing. If you if you want, if not, you will lose your track. Yeah, because. I love um, pursuing like different stuff, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't know what I want. So I'm like, I need And that's to- okay, Nancy. The more experience you have all over the place, the more um, more attractive of like a job candidate when you apply to stuff, you right. will be, especially with like the programs too, because they don't want somebody who's just like, you know, just knows one particular subject. They want people who have real world experience and that's great. Yeah, I would I would suggest maybe trying something out like Coursera has free pro, free like classes on like um, Python or C++ and just play with it and see if like you like it if it's too hard. Yeah, because that's something that's going to be a, you if you do a, an MSI program, they're going to want that. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm not that good with um, computer, but I like to sometimes play around with it because I, I have many friends IT, so they're like, you want to join me and play? And I was like, okay, I'll try it out. So that's why I was like, maybe I can try that. Yeah, so, but I'm, I'm going still, I'm still pursuing looking. Yeah, thank you for the advice. I think also too, there's an opportunity, I don't know, for all the candidates, well, I mean, all the panelists, which you think about this, but I think there's an opportunity in working as an archivist and a librarian to kind of make the position to what you want and kind of bring in those skills that you have and that you're good at or, or kind of your own initiatives and kind of building on that. I've had the experience to do that in my position, but I think as you go into the profession a little bit more, you kind of have, you know, that kind of freedom. I, I've experienced that. I'm not sure if, 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 um, others have that experience. <laughs> I think that's true. There is flexibility in making the position your own, but I think that the budget constraints that are coming um, in the future are going to um, change that. I think we're going to see that university librarians are going to have difficult decisions to make in the very near future. And that's why I believe that library science and libraries in general, especially university libraries are going to change quite a bit. Um, who knows? But it seems like it's already already happening, right? Yeah, I see that actually, like, cause um, this semester I've been doing projects. I, I've done three projects and it's all online and one of them, no, two of them got into the special archive for our library. So I was like, so I was like, yeah, it is slowly going online. I can see it happening now. So yeah. Yeah, one thing I will say just in terms of kind of where the field is going and sort of different different areas within the profession, I think, um, you know, we all have different interests, range of skills, but I, I think that one area that's also growing is just like, and I didn't really think about this at all when I was kind of, you know, going into it or even during my program is that it's like instruction is still really at the heart of it. So instructional design, I think is big. So it's like, you know, creating videos and kind of, you know, working with, um, you know, primary source instruction, in different capacities. So I don't want to, you know, those of you that say, oh, I don't have, you know, I'm not into the, you know, some more, more technical aspect. It's like, there is still a future and through different avenues, through your skills and instruction, because that is not really, that is a skill that you don't necessarily like learn in the program. You learn to teach through experience. So that is another skill that if you have it, either if you're a graduate assistant or if you're, you know, even an assistant in, in like as an undergraduate, right, where you're assisting professors with classes, that is still a very, very transferable skill and a very important skill um, within the field. So don't don't feel like you have to, you know, necessarily, you know, dive into the, the technical aspect of it. And, you know, you, you'll, you learn it too. It's like, I don't consider myself techie. And I, for a long time, I was like, oh my God, I'm like, no, I'm a humanist, but no, you can learn it. Like you, you really, really can. Um, if you kind of decide to, if you have, you know, certain projects that touch on certain um, areas. So, and just another thing I will say, the last thing I'll say is on feeling like you're all over the place. Like that's not a bad thing. I think part of 
um, coming into what you want to do is learning what you don't want to do. You know, I, I feel like I'm telling you, I probably just mentioned a few jobs, but I probably had, I think like six, seven different jobs in those, just that tiny little three-year gap. So I learned about all the things I didn't want to do. And that was incredibly valuable because sometimes in this profession, I hear some of my colleagues that are frustrated and, you know, academia can be a certain way, or, you know, we have frustrations, we have budget restraints, there's a lot of things happening in jobs and careers, but I feel very happy with my career choice. Despite that, I've tried a lot of other different things that I know I didn't want to do. So like, that is, I think the most important because I feel like I'm very happy despite, you know, some hiccups and sometimes some headaches. Like I feel very content um, with, with what I've chosen and I find a lot of satisfaction in my work and in my job. So. Thank you, Amalia. Um, we'll get to the next question. Um, Jill Lynn, if you'd like to um, ask your question. Hi, Hi. Um, I'm Jill Lynn, a master's uh, student in history and I'm, I'm close to finishing, but one of my um, next steps that I was considering was a master's in library and archival sciences. Um, and I was just curious, you know, I've, I t also took a gap year and I was teaching in elementary school and I taught, I substituted in high school and middle school. But um, with the pandemic and these kind of new budget restraints, um, I'm just curious as to, I mean, your personal opinion of what opportunities might still be out there for new hires or new people coming into the field. And um, as we were most of you touched on before, um, with this kind of switch to digital platforms, well, do you think that might be um, an, op an opportunity for a new type of position so that we can't, we're not to be too discouraged about, you know, budget restraints? Um, that's my main question. Because when I finished my bachelor's, I was interested in museum interns and things, um, but a lot of uh, museums in my area were, you know, doing massive layoffs and, or even closing. And so, you know, it's just something I, I'm keeping an eye out of about like, okay, when I finish um, and I'm looking for internships or employment opportunities, like, um, you know, it would be nice to have some, just a personal opinions of where you think the field is going. So I would say that I see colleagues getting positions now and applying for positions that are coming up. Of course, I'm not in the archival area, but um, so I know that there are opportunities that are still out there. And yes, you're right, there will be new kinds of positions that are um, going to be, um, I guess, um, created based on the needs that we see now and how, um, and thinking about the changes that are to come. So I would certainly um, feel encouraged if I were you to continue your pursuits in the field and keep an eye out to see what the trends are, are and what's coming up. And, um, and I wish you luck. I hope it works out because it sounds like you're on the right path. If this is of interest to you, that's the most important part, I believe. That Thank it interests you. you. Yeah. And a lot of you guys gave some wonderful advice. I appreciate you coming to the panel today. It's always helpful to hear from people who are actually in it and experiencing it. And I also have to say, because I am the oldest one here and I've been around a lot longer than the rest of you, this is a second career for me. And just because you make a decision in your 20s and you follow that path, doesn't mean that that's the path you're going to be on for the rest of your life. And there's no reason to um, not consider other options as you decide what you really like and want in life. And that's something that is, for me, key. You know, you, your general happiness, um, I would say, and, your, and following your real interests, I think is really important. Thank you, that was very helpful. <laughs> Okay, then um, we can have the next question from Diana. Hi there. Um, thanks so much for all the info today. Um, I have a similar question. I'm a, a first semester graduate student in the history department. And what I'm considering um, down the line is maybe a PhD in information science. 
And I, uh, I realize this might be a little bit beyond the scope of this panel, but I'm wondering if you guys have any um, sort of guidance as to where I could really inform myself about what a PhD offers versus an MLIS. Like I'm trying to make those types of, you know, get those questions answered somehow before I jump into something big like a PhD in that. Um, so I wonder, I was wondering if you, any of you had any thoughts. Thank you. Well, I'm not doing a PhD, um, Diana, but I have a couple of friends who are like in the midst of doing it right now. I'll, I'll say like probably for, first, you should probably like, you know, see which schools are offering a PhD in information sciences or um, uh, LIS, library and information sciences. And then there's very few, it's like less than 10 here in the United States. And that's, you know, there's the one in Canada too. Um, British, British Columbia, Vancouver, I believe. Um, so yeah, you know, get to know those schools. And then I guess like with the PhD from what I know with my friends that are applying currently is they have, they have an intense desire to like to do a research project and one of them has, one of them, uh, she's very interested in doing like indigenous language revitalization projects and how that's like, you know, and how those things get like, um, that information is made available online and like how, when you do things online, like what gets lost in the process, right? And specifically around uh, Aymara, uh, Aymara language uh, from Bolivia. And then the other person that I know of, her project is very, uh, she's very interested in doing like, you know, how do you make like, um, what's it called? Uh, spontaneous archival projects available, made available online. And so she's more interested in like the technical um, aspects of it, but it like her project whole revolved around like all the political like memes and Twitter and circulation of information that was happening when uh, the governor, Last year's last year, the governor of Puerto Rico, when he was ousted, um, and there was like a whole you know meme movement, uh, Ricky Renuncia, that was happening, and so her project is revolved around that. And so, yeah, I would I would say start with you know seeing which schools there are and what particular um, research you want to do with it, and checking out the professors there who could potentially support you. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there any other questions that anyone has? We have about two more minutes. <laughs> Nayeli? I was wondering, how does it that you find, like, um, or have you seen happening, how do you volunteer for libraries right now? Do you know if there's any position, like, things happening? in public libraries or academic libraries? Like how can one even do that right now in this climate? Um, I, I, I can answer that because we do take on volunteers right now. <laughs> so at Cal State LA, um, we do. Um, so you can contact me if you're interested, um, but it's all digital projects. It's not gonna be the same experience that you would get in person because we try to build kind of a team environment and we are transitioning our volunteer program and our, our student assistant program in, in the virtual environment. Um, and it has been a struggle, but I would just say, just reach out to whatever institutions you're interested in. They might not have a volunteer program, but just reach out to an institution you're interested in and see if they have any, a lot of people are working on their digital projects right now, like metadata cleanup and like transcription work on oral histories and digital projects, even, for us at Cal State LA is like transitioning to things like archive space because we don't have that. Um, and they're working on projects that are, are that kind of have been on the back burner that relate to, you know, the virtual environment. Um, so getting up to speed with that. So just look for contact people and email, you know, even cold call, like how Gladys had mentioned earlier, like cold calling. Um, yeah, or emailing, but you can contact me too if you're interested in Cal State LA. <laughs> Can I have your contact so I can contact you later, maybe? Oh, okay. Yeah, because I'm I'm interested, like, um, because next semester my courses are low, like, it's less than normal, so I'm like, I have more time. 
So I'm trying to find works in the library part. And because I used to help out museum, but now they close because of COVID. So I'm trying to find some stuff to do. I'll they put it in the chat. Yeah, and I think that ends it. Um, Dr. Erika Verma and Rico Ochoa, if you want to say anything at the, at the end of this session. Well, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, the panelists were absolutely wonderful and amazing. I want to thank my colleague Enrique for, for coming up with this idea and for, for make, moving it forward. And Acelia, you are a, a wonderful host. And I, I would like to just say something, and I'm sure Enrique might want to say something too, but I want to say to the students who are, are here, um, one of the things, one of the themes that I think really came up was um, you don't have to do, the, don't do this alone. No one does this alone. Find, find people. And I can speak as a faculty member. I know that there's faculty that are not very responsive, but a lot of the faculty here at Cal State LA really care about students. And you might not know that because you haven't asked for the help, but um, so ask them, say, I'm interested in, because no one knows how to do this until they ask. So say, I'm interested in, in an MA program. And if they don't know, then they might find the person who does. Um, I can offer you, I'm really good. I, I, I hope, I think I'm good. Gladys can say, I'm good at reading proposals and, and shooting them back at you and saying, work on this, work on that. I'm offering, I've got 10 hours less commuting than I usually do right now. So I can put my, um, so I guess what I'm saying is I really encourage you to not stay like, oh, I don't know what to do and instead say, choose someone else. I don't know what to do, right? Uh, really reach out and, and I do think you will. And if someone's not being helpful, walk around them and find the person who is uh, because it is complicated and there's so many questions. So don't say, well, I don't know the answer. Find, ask other people, we're here for you. Um, I'm gonna put my uh, email in the chat as well. And, and Rick, I don't know if you wanted to say something. Yeah, just very briefly, I, Grin, this was wonderful. It was great to see everyone and to hear everyone um, right, talk about their experiences and, and their shift away and their transition out of Cal State LA and what they're doing. Really want to thank Azalia for, for moderating it and doing such a wonderful job. Um, we're going to be doing uh, a few more of these over the, year, uh, over the course of, of the academic years, uh, talking about alumni and what kind of things alumni are doing. Uh, so alumni who go off into law school, alumni who are, um, who are working in the nonprofit sector. So stay tuned for that. Um, but again, thank, thank everyone. Thank the, uh, Teresa and Gladys and Amalia and Jimmy uh, and to Azalia for, for really a wonderful event. Thank you for having us. It was really nice to see everyone again. I really miss you all. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's so nice to see everybody. And thank you for inviting me. My professor, I had class today. She was like, go do it. That's important. You get all the credit that you were going to get for participation. I was like, thank you for, being, for supporting that. Okay. I forgot to say one thing that it's in the chat and we'll save the chat. So if you don't, anyway, if you miss anything, you can email me. Uh, but Kendall put up an amazing um, document. It's in the chat of, 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 uh, all, listing, you know, all of these organizations people have been naming of resources on basically on how to apply to, you know, on, 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 on the whole career. So please, if you missed it, um, email Kendall, email myself, we'll find, I'll find it and send you to Kendall, you know, whatever you need. But I, I forgot to mention that. Thank you so much, Kendall. That was And, and panelists, if you have um, other ones that I didn't add, let me know and I'll include them because I know I don't have everything and there's more resources that y'all mentioned that are good. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed the, uh, the time we spent together. And I've put my email address in there if anybody wants to know more about UNC Chapel Hill and our, or our library science um, program. Thank you.